the habits of the midterms are returned on the next, at the next class, and uh, we've already gone through them in the prior class uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, but yeah, so a few classes ago we went through the midterm. I'll uh, return the midterms that we graded and uh, that's at the next one. So we're, where we are just in the course is we're starting this new section with the liquid extraction and there's about a month of classes left. So we'll be seeing three or four new sections coming up over the next uh, few classes here in this course. The, the interesting thing with this next section is we're now taking a break from solid liquid separation. So all the prior classes to now have used solids suspended in a liquid phase of some form and we've looked at separating those solids out from the liquids. This section we're starting to really take a look at, at some slightly harder and harder separations. So we're separating liquids from liquids and in fact in this section there's three phases, uh, three liquids that we're going to be separating. And so consider if you're separating ion and solid. Okay, yeah, so yeah, except for reverse osmosis, yeah, there was, there was a small change, and it's kind of an interesting twist on just using a membrane to still for separating, but yeah, it's not a solid phase, yeah, that's a good point. So, liquid, liquid extraction, we're faced with a situation where we've got two liquids that we want to separate that are mixed with each other, and we want to remove one of them from the other. So we're, I'll introduce some of the terminology so we can be a bit more specific than that. So we're, we're facing the situation where we've got a feed. And that feed actually has two components in it. The feed has the solute, <coughs> which I wish to recover. So we'll call my solute A. So some particular dissolved species in that solute. So there's two components in the feed. The solute, and it's got it's suspended in the solvent. So the solute and solvent makes up that feed. So some sort of combination of those. And we'll call that solvent that's carrying the solute is often just simply called the carrier. So you sometimes see that other terminology. So feed then is actually made up of two components, the solute and the solvent. Now the solute is what I'm interested in. So this is my A. Recover this solute out of that solvent. So many separations consist of these two phases, or two, two species, I should say, but they're in the same phase. So the solute and the solvent here are in the liquid phase. We've got this dissolved solute in the solvent. So one example that you can think of is, for example, in distillation, you've got two hydrocarbons in a liquid phase, and you wish to separate those two hydrocarbons. What's the classic separator for that? Two hydrocarbons you wish to separate from each other. Distillation, right? So we've covered this uh, in many aspects of the courses in here at the university. So why might distillation well, let's, let's ask the question first rather, why does distillation work really well? What aspects is distillation exploited? Volatility. Okay, so it works well when there's the volatility difference. Okay. What, other, what else do we know about distillation that makes, that makes it, why is it so widely used? Works off of gravity. Works off of gravity because of distillation. Oh. Right. Oh, oh, I see maybe the liquid falling yeah. down in the vapor. Oh, that's like what you're referring to. Okay, yeah, so there's that exploiting that free separation of the vapor space from the gravity once you introduce the heat. Okay, good point. <laughs> so we've got distillation is widely used for separations where we've got large relative volatility differences. What might, what aspects of distillation might be a disadvantage in certain cases. Uh, heat intensive. It's very heat intensive. Right. Anything else about distillation that you know that may not be such a great advantage? You won't have a difference in volatility. Or one point, then you won't be able to separate the distillation. 
Okay, so if you've got a very small difference or, or, or close to zero difference in that relative volatility, anything else about distillation that we've sometimes seen in your courses? Well, you can't separate past a certain, you get to do azeotrope, you can't separate past that. Okay, so if, there is, if an azeotrope exists in the ratio, you cannot go past that. Okay, So you have to have a sequence of distillation columns if you've got a variety of, of, of materials you wish to separate. Okay. And then you notice that when you did, did your stepwise distillation design in 3M, you keep stepping up that, up that diagram, you get to a point where you have to add an entire tray for very small increments of separation. So you get to this almost very small minuscule steps and you really don't improve your separation by a whole lot, but now your capital cost is going up every, because it's a whole new trade every time, so your column gets taller and taller at every one of those instances. So separations which require many trades, azeotropes, and when you have high heat intensity, there's a disadvantage there for using distillation. And then we're going to look at an alternative here through the liquid extraction, where we can try to separate these two Phase, uh, two species that are miscible. So the liquid phase, the solute is dissolved or miscible in the solvent. We're trying to separate them out. Of the so a, a classic one that you can think of, for example, is vinegar and water. At home, you can mix vinegar and water. How do you separate the vinegar from from the water? Would be a would be a case of this, where the vinegar is your solute and water is your solvent or carrier. So what we're going to do then is. Okay, I'll be a little bit more specific here. We'll call this the feed solvent because there is another solvent that we talk about in, in liquid liquid extraction, and that's our mass separating agent. We're going to add an MSA to create the separation. Yes, um, If you had what a, um, species that like didn't mix, like some kind of polar and non polar, would you still have one that has a solute and a solvent? Okay, so if you had two species that didn't mix, so they uh, like oil water type, yeah. make sure, yeah, then we wouldn't be focusing on liquid liquid extraction as a, as a separation step. We're going to see that there's an aspect of that, however, to this. So they have to be able to mix Yeah, well, it's assumed that they're mixed, right? And that's why you haven't Separate. separated based on reality or, or allowing it to settle out. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a third species called our solvent. It's a mass separation. We're going to add that to this mixture, and we're going to blend this all up. And what we hope then is the solute moves into the solvent phase and leaves the feed solvent or the carrier behind. So there's an element here of mass transfer. We're going to exploit the mass transfer of the solute away from the feed solvent, or as we'll sometimes call this, we'll call this the carrier, and remove that solute into the solvent. So we've basically converted our problem from separating the solute from the carrier, we're going to end up with the solute in the solvent. So we've converted our problem from separating these two to separating these two. Okay, so it doesn't look like we've achieved very much here. But what our, the whole thing hinges on the fact that once we move our solute out of the carrier into the solvent, that we can then separate the solvent and solutes a whole lot easier. Okay, through some distillation prop step or some um, some other mechanisms. What was the big So like, why would why wouldn't the be go with the solvent? Okay, why would this carrier not go into here, into yeah, yeah. solvent? Here, we're going to see that coming up. We were going to select our solvent specifically so that it will target the solute, but not the carrier. Yes, yeah. yeah, so just to clarify, there's two different solvents that we use. Yes, it's, um, and this is why sometimes this takes a little bit of getting used to. We've got our solute dissolved in the feed or feed solvent. So we'll, we'll sometimes call this simply just the feed, or the carrier, or the feed solvent. There's multiple names for it. So if you want to be clear, we're going to take my, but the reason why I don't want to call it feed is because the feed is actually the solute plus the carrier. So if you want to be explicitly clear here, carrier is your 
the, the, the solvent that's carrying the sol solute. We're going to move that solute out of the carrier into this additional solvent that we're going to add. So three species will exist in the system. We're going to mix them up here in this device called an extractor. So this, this mixing is the mass transfer step. So mass transfer takes place. And then we're going to separate. So this extractor achieves two purposes. It, it allows this mass transfer to occur, but then we're also going to separate out into two streams, and we're going to call them the raffinate and the extract. What we're hoping for, and our aim is, that the solute A leaves in the extract stream. So this extract should be enriched with the sol solute, and the raffinate will be whatever is left over. Okay? Raffinate is the French word for remaining, so it's what's remaining goes in to in what we call the raffinate stream. And we'll use a bit of notation. Y refers to the, the molar fraction or the mass fraction, What's the concentration simply of A in the extract. So YEA is the extract stream's concentration of A. We're hoping that that's a high number. Whatever's left over of A, that goes in the residual solvent or the raffinate, we'll call it X. So X is the mass fraction or the mole fraction for the raffinate. This is simple convention that we use X's for the raffinate and Y's for the extract. And what, we'll, what we can define then is this value D, the distribution <coughs> coefficient. D tells us, well, this solvent is, is um, being added to the system. And here's my solute. And it's going to move into my solvent. So solute A, we will, we'll often refer to my solute A, the species of interest, we'll simply always designate it as A. It's going to move out into this extract stream over here. So YEA is that mass fraction. XRA is the mass fraction of that same species in the raffinate. So this distribution coefficient tells me how much of it goes into the extract in A and how much of A goes in the raffinate. So what does it mean for D to equal zero? No separation, in fact. Okay, so you, you've picked a solvent that's useless. Your solvent that you've picked, if D is zero, your solvent that you've picked has no <coughs> use, right? It hasn't picked up any of your solute. If, what would you like D to be? High, right? As high as you possibly can. So you pick a solvent that you're going to add to the system. So extracting solvent here. Add that to the system so that the solute loads up into that solvent as much as possible and leaves little or nothing in the raffinate so the denominator is close to zero and in other words your distribution coefficient is as high as you possibly can get. Yes? Um, sorry, I just want to put the extract where it says solvent, not solute. Is that Okay, so extract is the solvent is mostly present in this layer. Um, okay, it's the solvent that you've added. So let's let's take a look at you're adding this extracting solvent to this existing two species up here. The extract stream is the the name. The, so you're going to separate it out. The stream that you call the extract stream versus the stream you call the raffinate stream. The terminology and the definition for the extract stream is the stream where the solvent that you've added leaves it. Now you're hoping that that stream contains most of your solute, but the definition for extract is the stream which contains the solvent. So you're gonna, we're going to pick a solvent that's going to separate out, and that solvent is going to leave in the extract stream and hopefully take most of the solute. So this slide has got a lot of important terminology on it, which we're going to start to use for the next few classes. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this many times just to make sure that 
that you're understanding this. So let's take a look at where these are used. Um, we'll wipe, they're very widely used in bio separations. And the nuclear industry uses it for recovering uranium. In the mining industry, you'll see solvent extraction many times. So any of you that go into the mining industry will see this sort of device in your lab at guarantee. And so you're adding this additional phase, shaking it up in here, and you're hoping that your solute, which might be in this top phase over here, moves over into that lower phase. So your solute A started off in the carrier, which is this upper phase, so it's a, the lighter phase of our density. You shake up this, this flask, let it settle, and that solute will move over into that lower phase, which was the solvent that you added. Okay, so then you, you let it equilibrate, open the valve down here, let extract just this lower phase, and then you've recovered your solvent. So you may have done this experiment in chemistry, um, but not use this specific terminology. So what we're going to look at is applying this chemistry lab shaker device to large-scale continuous operation. This is essentially what we're doing. And as you can see from this, this simple experiment, it's all done in ambient conditions. So this is why, we, why it's used is because we do not need to heat up the material to create the separation. So wherever we're dealing with products which are very temperature sensitive, which would have normally been separated by distillation, we can actually achieve that same separation with this liquid-liquid extraction because we do not need to heat up to high temperatures. Okay, so that's why bioseparations will, will use this approach. We'll also use it a lot to see if you work in any sort of fine chemical process um, where you're dealing with very small quantities of chemicals, that applies to particularly perfumes, fragrances, essential oils, uh, where you're recovering very, very small concentrations of that perfume or that molecule from your raw material. So these fragrances occur in, uh, occur in very small quantities in natural ingredients, so orange peels and, and so forth will extract those fragrances out of those orange peels, but the, the percentage that that fragrance appears in that natural ingredient is very, very low. So if you're trying to extract it out into a solvent and recover that, that fragrance, that essential. There was a question. Um, okay, if the liquid liquid extraction, the first step, makes it break it off in two steps or five? It's the entire system of steps. We're going to break it down into three parts next. Okay. So on all three steps are temperature sensitive and these are temperature sensitive products. Well then what we were saying is that they are applied to the case where you're dealing with temperature sensitive products. So if you're doing a bioseparation, you don't want to heat up your biomolecules to high temperature, so but you still need to create that separation. This is one way of doing it. The other area where it's widely used is if you've got um, we could have used distillation. There is a high boiling point difference. But that species that you're trying to recover is in such low percentage that essentially to create the separation, you need to heat all your material only to recover a very, very small percentage of it. So that doesn't make any economic sense or makes low economic sense. So can we recover that species in some other way that does not require heating a large quantity of material only to recover a very small quantity of A that's initially present. So A is present in very low quantity. We don't want to heat by all this carrier fluid up as well, simply to recover a small amount of A. Uh, if you look at distillation, distillation will separate based on relative volatility, but solvent extraction, we can actually pick the solvent. This choice of solvent over here is done very specifically to target this species. So there's a wide variety of solvents available to us. There's, there's books and books where you can look up all the properties of many solvents. So we can find a solvent that will target a particular solute quite carefully. So this is, there's a lot of work that's been done characterizing solvents so that we can find one that will work for a particular solvent. Uh, we call solvent 
extraction or liquid liquid extraction works really well when you're dealing with two entities that have very close boiling points. So, so vinegar and water have <coughs> fairly close boiling points, but we can pick a solvent that will take vinegar out and leave water behind. So that fine. So instead of heating up vinegar and, and water and separating them based on their boiling points, we can rather use the solubility difference. And for azeotropes, we can use find a solvent that will break the azeotrope and separate out one of the entities. So let's take a look, before we get much more into the, the theory here, let's take a look at some pictures and understand this, the steps going on. This, a lot of people get confused initially with this section because there's so much new terminology. But let's take a look at what's going on inside this extractor. So the very first thing we have to do is we have to create this mass transfer or encourage this mass transfer to occur. So what, we, what we'll look at inside these, these vessels is at the end we'll have my feed and my solvent that I've added. But if I just add my solvents to my feed and just allow them to settle, there will be a phase difference over there. But this is not going to be conducive to mass transfer. Right? I have to create the mass transfer in there. So what I'll do is I'll add an impeller and cause strong mixing in that. Then turn the impeller off, allow them to settle out, and then recover my extract and my raffinate. So the very first step is to mix or contact those liquid phases coming in. So my feed and my solvent need to be mixed in some way. I'll cause and create very small droplets, create the dispersion, and that encourages or in, in, uh, makes this, make sure that the mass transfer occurs between those phases. Now, how long do you mix for? So the solute moves over into the solvent phase, but do I just leave this running and running and running? Like, what's, what am I limited by? Any ideas for mass transfer? I'm trying to move over the solute into the solvent. Anything that might, how long would I run the system for? Depends on how big it is, if you're running time. Or, sorry, like the volume. Okay, so does it depend on the size of the system? So if, you're, if it's well mixed, these are, are interdispersed, and that's exactly, you're trying to break that concentration gradient by mixing. So what I'm trying to make you think about here is, think of it along the lines of reactor design, right? So there's kinetics. The solute is moving into the solvent phase. There's mass transfer, right? So mass transfer occurs at a certain rate. So if mass transfer is really slow, that solvent takes a really long time to take out the solute, we're going to need to mix for long, long periods of time. But you can start to imagine a case where if I mix for an hour and then mix for two hours, there may not be any benefit to that additional hour. What does it mean to say something like that? The reasons are equilibrium between the right solute and between the solvent. There's some sort of equilibrium that gets set up, right? And you're going to reach that equilibrium after a period of time. So we know then that we don't need to run these extractors for long periods of time. There's going to be a period of time that's needed to mix. But if we keep mixing beyond that time, we're not deriving any benefit from that extra mixing. There's some sort of equilibrium that gets established. And that's, in fact, exactly what this distribution coefficient tells us. So this D tells us that 
at equilibrium after mixing, you're going to get only so much of the species A in your extract and only so much of species A in your raffinate, and that's your equilibrium distribution. Beyond that, but you, you cannot go beyond that. Mixing more is not going to make this D any larger. So you have to mix just long enough to achieve equilibrium to get to that uh, distribution. And fortunately, that equilibrium is reached fairly quickly in most situations. How do you know when you reach equilibrium? How do you know when you reach equilibrium? And he, how would you tell? So you're dealing with a new system, you've got a new solvent you're trying out in your company. How would you know that you've reached equilibrium? Experimentally, so you would just mix for different amounts of time. You can measure that, like your different streams, concentrations at the end. Right. Yeah. So there's no, no correct way of doing it other than just by experimenting. Um, and so the companies that will look at it, they're fairly sophisticated, they'll have um, like inline spectrometers and measuring measuring that so you get your answer really quickly. Okay, so we can we can measure those distributions fairly easily. So let's take a look then, once we've mixed, now we need to separate out, right? Because if I mix this all up, there's only one mixed phase here. I then need to let it settle, create those two phases, and then I pull one out and call it my raffinate, I'll pull the other out and call it my extracts. So this extractor here actually has a second component for a second region which encourages phase separation. So we're essentially reversing that mixing step. Uh, stop the mixing, allow the droplets to come together and form their two phases based on density differences and then split it out. So let's take a look at some equipment to do that. Um, and then I'll come back to this slide on some of the geometries. So, if you're looking at a mining company, you might see something along these lines where you've got a bank of solvent extraction units or liquid liquid extraction units. So here's my agitator up there, my impeller shaft going into a small vessel, and I've got my feeds coming in and out. And so we'll, we'll look at how those feeds are linked up in different ways. Here's another prototype unit uh, for, for testing. Again, you can see the black impellers or motors up there uh, down coming into, into a bank. So these mixing banks, if you look at the piping geometry, um, this one will go into this, this next vessel. This next vessel will leave, come out here, gets hooked up, and then they're, they're kind of front to back, front to back. So you, you, you see the impeller on this, on unit two, four, and six, and there's an impeller on one, three, and five. It's just they're flipped there for ease of piping. So what's going on in those units is that they're collected, connected, I should say, in counter-current fashion. We're going to feed over there, mix in this first unit, and separate. So there's mixing and separation occurring in here. The raffinate, recall, is the stream leaving that hopefully you've recovered most of your solute. Okay, based on equilibrium, you've recovered most of your solute, but you, you probably haven't recovered everything. So you want to do a, a second go at it. So you send your raffinate now into the second, second unit, mix in contact over there, send your raffinate now, which should have much lower concentration of your solute onto a third bank. You do that in counter current. Your solvent enters that last bank, picks up a little bit of that solute, send it onto unit two, send it onto unit one, and then here's your extract, which should hopefully be very rich in the solute. So that's countercurrent geometry. We're going to start off a little simpler first. We're actually going to look at cross current and we're going to start really simply and only look at one of these guys. In a few classes from now we'll get to this setup up again. Yes. Sorry, um, the last thing you said for the counter current was that your extracts hopefully to be rich in your in your solute. But that doesn't the extracts contain more so more so over yeah, so we're going to see how that's set up in a few classes from now. We'll get to that point. So we're going to end up being able to design these in a, in a few classes from now. We're going to start simply look at this setup, what the disadvantages are, and then move on over to counter current. So 
just where we're headed then is our main aim is to recover that solute. We want really high recovery of solute. So that means that we want low XR and high YE. So if we just come back to that original diagram, here's my carrier. Coming in, here's my solvent. So my solvent coming in contains no solute. My carrier, this contains the solute. And I've got two streams leaving, the raffinate and the extract. So with my raffinate, what I want then is my raffinate XR to be low. And my extract, which we'll call Y, I'll emphasize, we'll add subscript A to emphasize the species A, my solute. So what you want is your extract, this should contain the solute. The, the raffinate should have low <coughs> solute concentration. So just to emphasize the terminology again. XRA needs to be low, and YEA you'd like to be high. So sometimes we drop the A subscript because we're implicitly referring to the solute. Yes. Oh, when you say high and low, then how high are we talking? Like 95 or 99? Okay, how high is high and how low is, is low? So these are fractions, so obviously they're, they're between 0 and 1. A lot of it you will see is we don't have numeric bounds of because all you want is your extract to be as enriched in solvent as you like. But it could have a lot of solvent in there. So your solvent may, may make up most of your extract stream. So you don't, we don't put quantifiable numbers on it yet. We'll, we'll define a new recovery a few classes from now, which will give you a percentage, and that's what you want. So we're going to get to that one. But on the mass fractions, it doesn't matter what the numbers are. Okay, so let's take a look just at a bit of some of the, the mixing settler units. Because right now, I can see a few confused faces. You're wondering, well, if there's mixing in here, how can we also have settling? Okay, so we need to both mix the, the material up, but we also need to allow it to settle. So how do we do that on a, on a physical basis? Okay, so let's take a look at some of the geometries here. Okay, now this introduces yet some more terms, so let's, uh, let's take a look at this. The typical terminology that I will try to use is carrier or feed, but what's often done is that this carrier is called the aqueous phase. And the solvent is called the organic phase. Okay, and that, those terms will help you understand what, what, what's going on here. Because the organic phase later is going to separate out from the aqueous phase just due to the density differences. So the carrier phase often you can think of it as water that's carrying your solute or some other aqueous phase or non-organic phase, but then our organic solvent is then added and we'll mix that. So here's a, the, the tank is designed so that we have a region of the tank which is well mixed with my impeller, and there'll be baffles in here, with both feeds fed at steady state, continuously feeding your aqueous phase or your carrier plus solute. In other words, aqueous phase is carrier plus solute. Your organic feed then is your solvent. Mix this well, and as you're feeding this material in, it's, it's contacted, and it's going to force some of the old material out at the top, down through a path, and then that region is isolated from the rest of the tank. So this impeller here does not disturb this material, and this is your separate region. So I get a region then where there's this mixture of, of both phases, 
and then you just simply allow, as Mark had said earlier, some sort of time for these two phases to separate out. So you'll have a dispersed band or a dispersed zone where you've got mixed material. Given enough time, and this is moving slowly enough, your bubbles of organic phase will rise up and your aqueous phase will drop down and you have your two streams leaving. So which one is aqueous? Uh, sorry, which one is extract and which one is raffinate? On the right hand side. Sorry. Which one's the bottom? <coughs> and the top is the extract. Okay. So your organic phase is the same phase that you added here as what we call so as your solvent. That solvent stream, wherever the solvent moves to and comes out as, is what we call our extract. Yes. You find your extract is always in the top. No. Nope. Yeah. Anyway, which are, that's based on density. Yes. Yeah. So does that mean that the process is run continuously then? Yes. This is a continuous <laughs> mixer settler. So continually feeding and then drawing off your extracts and your afterwards. Okay, so large flow rates, 40,000, 40 meters cubed per minute. Those for large flow rates. Okay, so here's another one uh, common in the oil sands industry. You'll see this sort of dirt uh, <coughs> or in other areas. Where you, same, same thing, you've got this time I'm already pre-mixing my, my water and oil or my aqueous phase and my organic phase. It comes in pre-mixed in a T-junction or in an inline mixer, and they're, they're contacted here. And I'm allowing them now to separate out. So you've got, a, you've got this sort of opened, like it's got holes punched into it to allow material to move through it, but the rest of it allows, you don't, basically you don't want your inlet flow to disturb the setting that's taking place. So this sort of helps limit any turbulence in the vessel. So it's a flow distributor. Over here we've got sort of like a wire mesh. So think of the material, uh, the device that you scrub pots on. A wiry uh, Goldilocks type of thing. And it's essentially that. It's exactly that consistency of steel wool that you put over there. And it allows the vapor, uh, sorry, not the vapor, the organic phase to coalesce and separate out. So then your oil phase or your organic phase will report to the top and your aqueous phase will report to the bottom. There's an element of control here because you want, you don't want to withdraw your water phase so that that interface between the oil and the water moves out to the bottom. So you want to maintain this interface between oil and water to be roughly in the middle of the vessel. So you open and close this valve with a feedback control loop that monitors that interface height. So we, we monitor where that oil water phase height is in the vessel, and we make sure it re is retained between certain zones. So again, continuously operating. You can continuously <coughs> feeding material in, drawing out your aqueous phase and your water and your organic phase. That's clear. So some other units that, that look like that, you've got your emulsion coming in, you've got the staffle, you've got turbulence and then simply allowing separation here. Same, same principle as the previous slide. Okay, so here we've got columns now. You can also do this in, in a column-based system. So you've got get some more terminology. As you can see, this gets, starts to get very confusing. You go to different books. Uh, so in the British textbook, they call this heavy liquid and light liquid. Okay, so heavy liquid, this would be your aqueous phase, your light liquid would be your organic phase coming in, and there's, you allow them to flow counter current. So your light phase will simply, you have a, a spider over here to allow droplets of your light phase to form and float up, and your heavy liquid will drop down. So simply allowing that interaction naturally. So there's no mixing here, but this is going to work well for systems where there's an affinity for the solute to the solvent. So the solute will quite naturally move over into the solvent phase without excessive mixing requirements. Okay, so you're simply allowing gravity to do the work for you. Yet, some more others is if you want to provide a 
channels for that liquid to flow into to allow greater contact. You allow the interchange there of that liquid through on the light phase leaving up and the heavy phase leaving down, but you're increasing the probability of contact between the two phases using these uh, in, uh, traders on this. So think of the heavy liquid this time coming down here. The heavy liquid is going to move and, and want to settle down inside the lighter phase. It's going to accumulate on that tray, then drop over, fall down to the next tray, much like a distillation column. Except in this case, we don't have vapor and liquid. We have just two liquids of different densities. Some other designs will have plates inside the vessel that rotate. So you, you feed in over here, and you've got a portion of your column. You provide agitation internal to the column. So again, same, same idea as before, but you want to contact the, the liquids, so you provide some sort of agitation. What you can also do is you can make this impeller shaft not only rotate axially, but vertically up and down. So this we call a pulsating column, so this whole shaft will pulsate up and down and encourage the mixing between the two phases. And then finally, here's a German design um, that's kind of interesting. If you take a look at it, what's going on here, we have two, two liquids, and the gray liquid is your heavier phase. The white region there is, is liquid. That's not air. Um, that's a liquid phase in white, in drawn in white. And you fill up this entire tube with those two phases, so roughly half and half mixture. And what you do is you rotate this internals in the tube, what it will do is, as it rotates, these C-shaped scoops will scoop up the heavier liquid, bring it up, and then as it keeps rotating, that heavier liquid falls out into droplets through and interspersed into the lighter phase. So you're creating that mixing of the heavier liquid, those gray droplets, into the lighter liquid phase, given white. Similarly, the same scoop will keep rotating, pick up the lighter liquid now, bring it into the heavier phase, and allow those lighter liquid to bubble up through the heavier phase. So it's achieving mixing on both, um, in both ways. And what's really great about this unit is the, the gentle action. So sometimes if you go to these devices where you're agitating and pulsating, you can actually create foams and scums uh, during that mixing process which will deter your your mass transfer. So we don't want to do that. And to minimize the formation of foams, you simply reduce your agitation intensity or move to something like this which is fairly gentle on the on the two liquid phases. And then the baffles in between allow um, allow it to move slowly through the tube rather than uh, you get your if you didn't do that, you'd get your usual uh, parabolic flow profile forming that you recall from fluid, fluid mechanics. So these baffles simply ensure that the, the mixing occurs before it moves on. You get sort of like a plug flow. So if you look at the entry and exit points, you would feed in on one side, you'd feed in over here, and your extract would leave over there, and your solvent would come in over here and your raffin would leave on the other ports. So two ports on the left, two ports on the right. Whenever we look at these solvent extraction units, you'll always see four streams. Two in, two out. So what we're going to look at in this, in this section of the course is we're going to initially decouple the, ex, the solvent mixing step and then have a separator. So we'll conceptually consider it as mixing and then separation and settling out into extract and raffinate. But bear in mind though that these units can often be integrated as we've seen just prior to this. Now, as I said earlier, this raffinate leaving, this raffinate should contain little solute. Hopefully your solute is all leaving out in the extract. But we said that sometimes we're just limited by pure equilibrium. The equilibrium simply says that you can mix for as long as you like. You're not going to achieve any greater movement of your solute out into your extract. So we accept that. And 
but we don't want to throw this raffinate away. This raffinate still contains valuable solutes, so it becomes the feed to a second round of this. So we'll link up these units in that round. Okay, now here's one final slide that we'll end up this section with the next class. We'll look at some of the mathematics and, uh, and uh, those and some of the ternary diagrams that do this, that tell us how this separates. But recall that I said earlier at the start of the class that essentially what we've done after all of this is we've co converted our problem from a solute that's dissolved into a carrier. What you end up with leaving now is you've got a solvent a solute in your extract stream. So you've really just changed your problem from one separation to another, where you now have to move your solute and try to get it out of your solvent. Okay. So here this very first column is doing the initial step of moving your solute out into your solvent. So here's my acetic acid vinegar coming in, and I'm going to use some sort of solvent to try and take up that vinegar. That acetic acid is A, my solute in this example. So this column here is my liquid-liquid extraction column. And I have leaving the extract and the raffinate. So the extract stream here will hopefully contain most of that acetic acid, but now <coughs> the extract is acetic acid plus solvent. So that stream up there, is acetic acid plus solvent. To recover that acetic acid, I send it down to a distillation column. So that distillation column will separate out my, my two streams for me. The acetic acid will come down here at the bottom, leave in the bottom of the column. I exchange some heat with the feed first and then take it out. So that's how I extract my solute. My solvent then leaves at the top of the distillation column and gets recycled back around to be reused. The so solvent will always see this. There's no point in using fresh solvent every time. You want to recover your solvent, separate out the solute from your solvent, and then feed the solvent back in again. So we're going to see a few examples of this coming up in the next few classes. Any questions on this terminology? Yes. One question. Why doesn't the ore have to reverse the solution column? It makes it so Okay, so the raffinate, okay, so bear in mind that all three of, all these streams contain all three species. So your solvent, your uh, your carrier, and your solute exist everywhere. Right? So we, we blend up then that raffinate. So this raffinate here also contains solute, and also contains some solvent. So we, we that's what this distillation column is doing for us to recover some of that. And then we combine it up and send it, send it back. So not my solvent, my solvent will sometimes also come out in the raffinate screen. So in the second distillation column, the carrier column Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll close this slide with the actual mass balances on it. You can see the relative percentage.